year of 2016 coming up fast on what I think many of us consider to be a welcome end to um, a year that, that saw tremendous change and um, the hearkening of what I'm going to call the new age of imagination to that end with us tonight. And with me tonight is Emily Moyer, my co-host. Say hi to the peeps out there. Hi, everybody. Glad to be back with you after a week or two off. And our guest tonight is Kara St. Louis, who probably needs no introduction at this point. She's been with us at least three times so far, I think. And four. Uh, I, think, yeah, I think four, more. maybe four. Who's counting? I mean, you yeah. and I talk all the time. But uh, we're, we're going to talk about some really important subjects tonight. Kara has a new book out with uh, author, co-author Maria Wheatley called Guardians of Blood. And that book focuses on um, Celtic culture, the Fae, the hidden stream of history that we've talked about with Kara numerous times. And now we go into seed race and human origins. And Kara, welcome to the show. Thanks, Randy. Good to see um, you again. Good to talk to you. Yeah, you know, as we were coming, coming on tonight, um, we were kind of engaging in a lot of talk about where we are in time right now, and that seems to be a big issue. The, um, the reckoning that we have is so damaged because of the, 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 the history that's been altered, and you've, you've mapped that out. You did that in workbook one, your previous work. First off, before we go anywhere tonight, let's let people know where they can find you, where they can find your books, all of that, just unpack it. Okay. Well, I have a YouTube channel too. It's called Hard True. Um, basically, I use it to park all my lectures and interviews and things like that. This one will be there eventually, but you should watch it on Randy's channel first, obviously. Um, <clears throat> and within the context of that <clears throat> um, YouTube channel, I do a little vlog I started this summer that's called 13. 13 is the number of transformations, so that's why I named it that. And, and it's a real freewheeling kind of free form uh, ex expository experiment. I often use it to discuss issues that are coming to me from the um, alternative community. Sometimes I will use it to try to clarify something in a piece of work that I've done that's causing uh, some serious cognitive dis dissonance. And sometimes I just use it to complain, you know, <laughs> I basically. <laughs> But basically, um, and that's the experimental part of what I do. And the reason I think that that, one of the biggest reasons I think that that's important is that um, because everything I do is about the imagination, I, I think it's really, really important to, um, to, not pre to present things that could be tremendously 2D and as enlivened a way as humanly possible on, in this kind of medium. I think that should always be our goal. Um, I still, well, we'll talk about this later, but um, I avoid the Aristotelian PowerPoint 2D. You know, I just won't go there. I just will not go there. That's for people who are still driving their brain bus. Ah, you yeah. know, um, and we can't be there anymore. We cannot be there anymore. It's too sclerotic. We're nailed down. We're prisoners in our own brains. Um, I also have uh, a magazine of my own that has been sadly neglected called Vortex 
uh, conscious and courageous, but it's still got five, 600 really crackerjack articles in there, some by me and some by uh, many other wonderful, wonderful activists and writers. Um, I have an author's page on Facebook. And then I also, as Randy was saying, I, I have six titles out right now. Um, you could get them on Amazon. Um, from Consolata's Companion to The Sun Thief to Dangerous Imagination. And by the way, that's still neck and neck. The, the best-selling book I've got, Randy, is Dangerous Imagination. Even with the new book, they're head to head, you know. Um, and then I have this compendium that I will be putting out, the second book of which is called The Workbook. And that's been put out in episodes. Episode one was a uh, 50 or 60 page treatment of 2,000 pages worth of research by uh, Anatoly Flamenco and about 40 or 50 of the most brilliant videos by Sylvia Ivanova that you've got to see. The New Earth series. Boy, she's really out there kicking some ass right now, too, you guys. I don't know if you've noticed, but she's taking all her stuff and she's mm. organizing it. Man, is it Yeah, powerful. She, she's really gotten her act together. Wow. She's also... She's also stepping out a little bit, and maybe we'll have to look into getting her on, because I know yeah. she did an interview with Greg Carlwood over at Hireside Chat, which was awesome to hear her voice. They're good so, friends. Um, yeah. I think it was Greg who, it was probably Greg who introduced me to her. Yeah, she's been um, on show a couple times, yeah. Yeah, Greg's pretty yeah. great. Um, yeah, it's the only thing is, I she had agreed to interview, for me to interview her, but she won't do anything visual. She will only do radio. Mm -hmm. Okay, so be aware. She doesn't want her face out there. And you and we can all figure out that one out. You know, of course, she'll come and talk to you on radio, but she doesn't really want her face out there. Anyway. Well, we're, 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 kind of, we're kind of media uh, agnostic here. We'll do anything, whatever it takes. Voice. Whatever it takes, We'll do a right? slideshow, you know. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever that goes. Um, also, and then there's the second episode in that, in what will be a three-part trilogy. And that was my attempt, my first pass at the bay and all of this information was flooding toward me um 50 or 60 pages of that and, and the nice thing about these episodes in the workbook is that um it's really me doing all this research and then trying to present it to the broadest possible audience but giving you my primary resources so if you want to go further you can but it's really just like that first layer and i think that's really really important um one of the things that i've worked really hard on in the last six years or so is trying to understand how to deliver this information to people you know that is really important and it changes all the time because it's like a race it's yeah. a race all the time because they're there they the, the um, adversary is um is mimicking you you know they're mimicking what we do constantly yeah. and so they direct people's attention they just divert it ever so slightly it sounds almost right but it's not quite right and it's just going the direction that they want it to go or um, they're coming up with new and better ways to engage our people's subconsciouses without them even knowing that which is um, actually something I talk about at the beginning of my lectures right now um, and if you want to see us um, I've got a I've got a lecture I just came from San Francisco it was a blast an absolute blast I'm going back next August I'm putting out like um, well, I'll be in New Mexico for a lecture and a workshop, and then I'm going to Northern California for um, like 10 lectures and five workshops at the end of the summer. And so I will be back in the United States, and I, and I don't really, I haven't set up all my US gigs yet, but um, February 12th, I'll be in Groningen in Holland, and um, that's one of those cities that has a star fort, Randy. Do you know what I mean? You gotta look them up, star fort in Groningen. And, um, and then on the 24th of February, uh, Maria and I are so excited and happy and looking forward to um, doing the first real lecture together on this new book, Guardians of Blood and Fire. Um, and that will be at Rudolf Steiner House Theater in London. And I don't care if there's five people there. I think we're, we're trying to fill the theater, obviously, but it's just the perfect place to have it, you know? And for those of people around the world who cannot come, we're looking into doing a podcast, a simultaneous podcast. I hope we can do that. But this is what you have to do, isn't it, Randy? You have to figure out ways to get. Multimedia, multidisciplinary yeah. communication yeah. on a number and of in levels. Real time, in real time, so people don't have a chance to mess with it. Do you know? Yeah. Anyway, 
So that's okay. So that's what I'm doing, and I, I'll be quiet. <laughs> Well, if you're quiet, I don't think we have much of a show. So I don't know. We're, I, not gonna, Randy, we're not going to let that happen. I, I could just talk till Randy falls over. So I really want to talk about some of the concepts that are in the new book, Guardians of Blood and Fire. And I miss, I dropped fire off the title at the beginning of it. That was um, my, my inability to read my own cues. But um, this book which comes on the heels of the first workbook, which mm -hmm. I, maybe we can explain, you can explain this. The workbooks are a different approach to knowledge as opposed to this book, which mm -hmm. is a more concentrated breakout of some subject matter that actually right. appeared in the first workbook. So, yeah, yes. <clears throat> and that's me being my own teacher in a way, mm -hmm. um, exactly the way I want other people to look at the workbooks. More information came to me, um, deeper and better information, more insights. Um, as I was putting, you know, once these things start coming to you, people kind of start coming out of the woodwork with information for you. Yeah. Some of it is just sort of a bit redundant, maybe a personal kind of vignette that they're telling you, and some of it just knocks your socks off, you know? And so people were bringing me stuff and bringing me stuff and knocking on my door. And that's what happens, you know? Especially if it's like this, if it's an entity that wants to be known, that wants to be heard. Not, I mean, not as any kind of a savior programming thing, but they just want to make their presence known because there are entities on this planet who aren't going to be too happy that that's the case. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like an opposite power, in a way, has appeared to balance things out a little bit and perhaps even push, turn the tide. Talk about away. that a little bit, because, yeah. you know, even now I think people are trying to come to terms with who the predators or predator, depending on how you view it, is yeah. are. The, um, for a long time we've lived with this Anunnaki myth, which has been all over the internet, which, yeah. you know, but we've kicked that one around before. Yeah. Kind of old dated mythology which was also, by the way, a mask for a real enemy that was here that had interfered. I mean, the whole ridiculous concept that we were bred, bioengineered to be gold miners toiling in the dust for the Anunnaki gold, that was a complete distortion of history. But tiny nuggets of truth there. But the real enemy is much more insidious, much darker, and has interwoven itself into our reality for a very long period of time and right. I won't put the number on it maybe you can I have my own theories about that but we're talking specifically here about the Draco reptilian type mm -hmm. entities right and, the Ar but, and of course the Archons the Ar <laughs> right? of yeah. course I mean yeah. actually this is something I touch on in the book there are three or four that I felt were necessary to bring uh, in, in ways I might not have thought were necessary, except that people were being profoundly irresponsible talking about these um, negative entities. And I couldn't let that stand, especially if it, was, if, it were, if, it were, if it was a person who might have some credibility, do you know what I mean? Um, it was lazy, lazy thinking. And uh, yeah, so um, there are three or four going on right now. We've talked about the Drake. Okay, I'm, trying, I'm just trying to figure out how to, how to get into this. Draco definitely, um, very much a presence on this planet. Um, you know, Harold Kaltzvela identified, self-identified as Draco. Um, he just did. He told me that, and uh, and I, he probably would tell you that tomorrow. He just does, and um, which which it makes it interesting that he was hanging out with me and doing work with me because I also know some people who identify as Draco or Draco Mantid who won't even be in the same room with me because we are complete opposite energies. You know. Yeah. Um, it's like having an allergic reaction to yeah. what's in front of you. Um, so there, the Draco is an absolute real presence here on the planet. However, I do not subscribe to the idea that we are all part of this reptilian um, blood pool. Um, and I think that one of the things that science, scientism has done to disturb <laughs> humanity is try to convince us that this reptilian brain makes us all reptiles. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That, pushes us into this, this Draco area. And that, and that in fact is not the case. 
the negative parts of what are going on are starting to solidify for a lot of us, like Randy, like myself, like Emily, because we're thinking about it, talking about it, working on it, writing about it, sifting through it. They still have not solidified yet, but you better believe that the Draco are, the Draco are real. The planet that the Draco came from is not too far from the planet that the Fae came from. Um, the planet that the Fae came from was traced by a fellow called um, Erhard Landmann in Germany. He was kind of this John Nash character, you know, who saw sets of symbols. And this is something that you'll find in both books. A little bit more in detail in the second book, but um, he, saw, he saw patterns in words, you know, that led him to be able to create a structure, an etymological structure, it seemed to indicate that, there, that the planet that the Fae had come from could be found. In fact, it is a planet called Fecta in the um, constellation of the Big Dipper, which is called the Plow, I think, in England, which is just in mm. front of Ursa Major, um, in the bottom left-hand corner. And in fact, one of the reasons, one of the most exciting pieces of evidence that goes along with all of this is that that particular um, constellation, as it goes through the course of the year appears to circumnavigate the polar star Polaris and it becomes a swastika. Now, in my research, and some of you have heard me say this before, but in my research for the second book, the big book, um, I came across evidence that the first known um, and verified incidents of people finding a swastika on this planet goes back to 40,000 BC. That doesn't surprise me a bit. I think the Fae have been here forever. It's, it's that timeline thing. It's that history thing. It's that not understanding. It's that being completely confused as to the timeline and the history of what's actually happened. So I felt like, okay, so the Draco I did touch, touch on a little bit, but I feel like the Draco have actually been accepted as an entity on this planet. What happened was someone took the Fae and lump them together with the jinn and the archons and demons and called them the same negative entity. Yes, and you know who did that? Did you saw my post? You're going to get me in trouble. Who did it, Randy? Who did it? Who did it, Randy? It was King James. Uh, no. Uh, well, it was King James. That was King James? Okay, so. What about, what about in the new Mandela effect in King James Bible? Did he do it there, too? <laughs> Oh, that's right, King James. You just put something out of that demonology, didn't you? Yeah. Was that you? Demonology, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so I had to break that down, you know? I had to break down Archons, which came from John William Lash. You know, God bless him for putting that out. <clears throat> what they really are um, and what uh, the Jinn really are. People think that they're seeing the Fae and they're seeing the Jinn. People have got to understand what the Jinn are. They have to. And... Um, and then also I did a little bit of work on demonology, not too much, because I really didn't want to have to live in the negative. The one thing I will say, uh, which I find to be an interesting postulate about demons, is that there is a fellow out there, Thomas Sheridan, whose work is good and objectionable sometimes. Um, and he, says he has stated, he made, he's made a statement that I find rather interesting, and that is that demons are kind of, can be viewed like, almost as if they're wildlife from a different dimension that somehow we capture against their will and bring into this plane. And then they're just having a fit, you know, until yeah. they realize that until, until someone either puts them back or they realize that they can get in us and kind of just start like, feel, feeling, you know, the, the sensual, what is it to be, I don't know. What do you think about that theory? I think it might hold a little bit of water. Yeah, no, that sounds that, that sounds actually really, <laughs> that sounds that sounds pretty close to it. Can I you, do think so. Yeah. Can you do us a favor? Every we have we have a lot of a lot of newer listeners who maybe the Fay is a topic that has popped up on Randy's show on and off for several years. Um, you've spoken about it some here. We have you know lots of new listeners this year. Yeah. Can you just you? I think most people have a pretty good understanding, at least our listeners, of what the Draco are, what the reptilians are, what the archons are. From your perspective. Who are the Fae? Oh, well, that's my, my, and I know Randy has, uh, you know, it's funny because from the very first time Randy and I did a show together, we started talking about the Fae. Isn't that interesting? It was long before I started writing about it. 
Um, anyway, the Fae, yes, they are, in my opinion, the seed, one of, if not the seed races um, existent on this planet. There's all kinds of evidence that points to that. Um, my research, that's sorry, that's my dog. My research leads me to believe that um, you're actually a, a, a piece of race. You got a cat and I got a dog? What's going on? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. attacking the food dish right now. <laughs> ah, mine's whining and barking in the background. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So my research indicates that the Fey are, in fact, an, a, a race that we know as the Tuahadadanan. Uh, very much an Irish, myth, you know, mytholog mythological race. As a matter of fact, they are, are very, very real, and they were very, very real. Um, somebody led me to study the Bardic Tales, amongst many other things. But I was led to study the Battle of Moitura, which described the first battle between the Fomorans, who were supposedly a giant race, a race of giants that came from under the sea, and the Tuahadidanan, actually according to the legend arrived in burning crafts isn't that what we were talking about with walter bosley last week the twat is yes. it the same people the twat Danan? okay yes it's twat exactly. yeah. yeah the question is do we have the same um idea of who they were because right. people do talk about them and they talk about them as magical mystical creatures for me they are the noble people that we are all descended from um they were around for a very very long time um the first humans, in my opinion, were a combination, were uh, bred between the Fomorans and the Tuahadaganan. These are, excuse me, these are the bad fairies and the good fairies. And then the book traces the, uh, you know, the twisting of the idea of who these entities were up till now. They, in my, in my research, in the case that they covered the globe, it was one culture that covered the globe. And this is one of those things that answers the question of, of civilizations that are global, that are so very, very similar, do you know? Um, yeah. Because it was one culture and it covered the globe. And uh, that was the first battle. And the battles that we're engaged in now, it's all part of the same battle. It's like one searing battle that started then and has, has come down to us through the ages. The bad, if you will, the bad fairies chasing the good fairies. Yeah. And they were here and they probably still are. Remnants of them in physical form are still here, I'm sure. They were still building. Um, uh, Sylvia Ivanova calls them the survivors of Atlantis. Mm -hmm. I think that they go further back than that. I think it's the Fae, okay? Um, they were still building up to a few hundred years ago. And there's all kinds of evidence for that. So, however, there was a time, there was a time, okay, this is where I get a little mystical, but real. There was a time when, um, you know, the Roman army never invaded Ireland. Did you realize? I, I had not known that. But the Catholic Church did, the Roman Catholic Church did. And when they did, they took, they, when they did, that was a real battle between good and evil, okay? The Fae, I believe, either decided to withdraw, wed themselves to the earth in ways that we don't entirely understand anymore. It's also possible that, that Sophia took them as well and saved them and brought them in and what, you know, and that they were wedded in that way. Um, this, this thing, the, one of the biggest clues that, I, that one has it, about the time in which this happened was this spell, this mat, this spell that they used called the Fae Fiada. Have you heard this cry of the deer? It's also called, it got stolen by the uh, Catholic Church and they use it, they call it uh, the rune of St. Patrick or St. Patrick. Yeah. Yeah. It's, not Catholic. it's not Catholic. It's not Catholic. It's one of the most mighty pieces of magic you can utter. Um, and you call it, it's pronounced the Fae Fiata, which I actually thought, what a royal joke that is, because, because <laughs> the faith, F-I-F-A-I-T-H, is what got between us and Tioha de Ganon, or the Fey, you know, and they actually stole this, this wonderful, mighty working at Terra today in this final hour, you know, I call on the earth with its power. Anyway, did I, did I get close to answering that for the people out there about who the Fey are? 
Yeah, so, so you, you answered another question I was going to have, which is, are they still here? And you said there are remnants and, you know, little pieces maybe here and there. But do you think it's possible that they are, Randy and I have discussed this, that they are here, actually here, possibly existing, possibly underground, or possibly existing just outside of our vibration, that they're all around us and looking for us to create the kind of energy that enables them to communicate with us? There's all kinds of possibilities, those kinds of possibilities, and there's about 10, 10 different directions I can go from that question. So if I keep asking you to reiterate it, because I want to take it, I want to not miss a, a direction, okay? Okay. Yes, it's possible that they're all around us. It, what is all around us would, be, would probably <clears throat> astound us, okay? This is one of the reasons that the plasma that we're breathing and, and, and existing in is being changed and altered. This aerosol war. Yeah. Victor, yeah, Victor Schauberger, who is this amazing scientist, yeah. naturalist, said that people cannot see without an atmosphere. Well, okay, if people cannot see without an atmosphere, and we have a pretty limited range of uh, visual spectrum right now, what does that do to our eyesight when the plasma has been altered, I wonder? Does it change what we can see? Does it change how we see things? Does of course it does. It, it you actually out. brought up one of the bullet points that I wanted to talk about, which was this environment which is required for us to, quote, see, meaning physically see. Mm -hmm. But, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the, I heard something recently, and I wish I could roll this back and find where I heard it. And it may have actually been the TV show, The OA, which Emily and I have been watching, which is about, a, uh, um, it's a long story. The central character is a, is a Russian female who becomes blind as a child. Later on, she has a seven-year traumatic experience, very MK Ultra, and she regains her sight as a result of a trauma. <clears throat> but there was, it was either in this or it was something related to it where somebody says, even though you couldn't see, you could, it was in the airway, even though you couldn't see, you always had the ability to see. So vision is tied to environment and it's tied to visual perception. Mm -hmm. But it is also subject, as we well know, to being in certain locations, certain milieu. Um, mm -hmm. If, you know, you spend any time in the desert at all, I got to tell you, there's some mystical places on earth. For me, the deserts outside of Sedona were a place where I definitely experienced shifts in visual perception on a terrestrial level. So we have this whole thing opening up to us, which I think is the 2017 thing where vision is going to be enlarged because of some energetics that are going on. Right now, on this planet, mm -hmm. we have this gigantic plasma thing that's going on, which oddly enough is infused with helium and seems to be doing something energetically on the planet. To everybody. <laughs> everybody, yeah. They yeah. don't even, even freaking know it. Uh, some of us know it. <laughs> well, you know yeah, I mean, you can like totally hide uh, for that. Yeah, yeah. Well, but aren't, isn't this a whole, uh, this is an interesting, interesting wide arena of, of conversation, you know, and this is how we sense things, how we see things, what is sight, you know, yeah. why, and, and, and honestly, we don't need our eyes to see, we know that. There was a guy, Jacques Lusperin, who there was a book on, what was it, um, something about the light. Anyway, it's a very, um, it's a very compelling story about a boy who loses his eyesight very early on, but because his parents don't treat him like he's blind, he learns how to see in every other way, and he can visually actually see. Of course we can. We could do anything, for God's sake. You know? Yeah. yeah. Well, also, I, I see far more interesting things with my eyes closed than I do with my eyes open anyway. So. She does. She does. Yes. Yeah. 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 The thing, the thing that I think we have to remember is that um, it, it's all coming down to this idea of plasma, whether it's plasma in the air, plasma in our bodies, the water is a plasma. It's all of this manipulating of the plasma around us, which is also, which is basically about frequency, isn't it? 
And mm -hmm. if we, if our visual, if our visual acuity wasn't tremendously important for some reason right now, I don't know that they would be messing with the plastic. Yeah. That's the extent that they are. So your question could be them if, if that's the case. I also think that they decide when they're out and about and when they're not out about and as some people have so rightly said they're here to tend the apple tree you yeah. know um and the reason that came up is because somebody asked me i think it was carlwood asked me <clears throat> if they're here to do good then why don't they make themselves known well because they're like elementals they're complete i think they're completely amoral they don't subscribe to our ethics and morals they have no reason to do that and they're here they're here, they're the guardians of all the magnetic energy on the planet. Certainly they're the guard, guardians of the ley lines, you know, that's simple. How mm -hmm. that works and how we manifest with the ley lines and, and all of that is in um, guardians of blood and fire. Um, and, and that's who they are. That's, 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 that's their sort of blood and their life and their, and their, their being on this planet is with all this magnetic energy, particularly in the ley lines. So if they're taking care of the apple tree, so to speak, then the apples get taken care of as well. You know, we are their children. We are their seed. We, we you know, essentially what happened long, long ago was a Morin, two sets, just like Cain and Abel, by the way, um, mm -hmm. A Fomorin and a Tuahadagana bred as a result of a rape, and that was a fellow called Bress. A Fomorin and a Tuahadagana bred as a, re as a result of consensual, affectionate friendship, and that became this uh, mighty first human called Lou, L U U G H. You know, you, I'm sure you've heard that one as mm -hmm. well. And then there was a battle between the two. Yes. And Lou, and Lou vanquished, you know, became the. Anyway, however, um, the two Ahadadana were still there breeding with everybody. And so that became the she, S I D H E. That's oh something my God. we talked about. Wow. That's the she. Yeah. About. Wait. Oh, I wasn't expecting it. So uh, this is okay. So I have to get into this now since you said that. <laughs> so I was, okay. It was not, not, okay. So I don't know if you remember this. This is before I even joined Randy on the show, but I was messaging back and forth with Lee Little with you on Facebook about something called the Ferens. I don't know if you remember this. It was about nine, ten, maybe a year ago. Okay, fill me in. Okay, so I we, we went back and forth a little bit, and and I. Nice, yeah. I hope I was nice to you. You're nice. Yes. <laughs> You're nice. You're nice. Oh, so, okay, so there was a thread, and somebody was talking about someone that had. Uh, you were talking about the fae, and then someone was talking about they'd had some 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 entity come to them in their dream and say that they were the fairy. And then I said, that's interesting. I'm f familiar with a group that call themselves the Ferns. Ferns uh -huh. spelled. F A I R N S. Ferns. Okay. Ferns. And so I found out about the Ferns from a friend who has had a many year relationship with them through a channel. And I'm not usually too big on that kind of stuff, but yeah. he gave me this book and I started reading it. And all of the things that they were talking about were not nonsense, you know, new age, right. silly stuff. It was all stuff that were things that I had been looking into through my own research. It was very real practical knowledge. Mm -hmm. And um, so they, can, they, they refer to themselves as a soul group entity that sort of, they explain the layers of like density and vibration and reality that kind of exists somewhere, you know, sort of above us, but mm -hmm. they're, they're sort of looking for us to create a certain kind of positive energy for them to be able to communicate back and forth. But they, right. they communicate through this particular woman. And I actually did a few sessions with her and, and they talk, they're, they're thing that they're really big on. They'll get into all sorts of stuff, right? But they're very big on um, the environment. And it's yeah. just funny because we're talking about the plasma. They're really obsessed with health and environment and balance, but they'll get into talking about things like cold fusion and free energy. I, 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 but, but they knew about Buckminster Fuller and all this kind of stuff. And oh, right? I was just talking about him today. But How here, here, right. <laughs> so they're really, they're really into that. They, yeah. the, per, the person who I know, who, how I got introduced to them, she got introduced to them when she was having a health crisis and they told her about Candida and helped her, her figure, sort out her health crisis and whatnot. Right. And <laughs> they refer to people as she's, S-H-I-S, she's, not he, not she, everyone is she's. Yeah. So, so we are, we, okay, they basically, what I feel like is I feel like 
they were under threat. This is just my opinion. They were under threat here on this planet or they got some cataclysm happened. They also speak a lot about the misuse of what they call force diamonds, which are large crystals that have a lot of power and how they were misused and caused environmental and energetic cataclysm here. So my, mm -hmm. my thing is I think that they scattered, that they went and hid wherever they could and they had the spiritual knowledge to understand how to hide just outside of this frequency, just outside of this dimension. And yeah. so I, I think, feel like while there's probably many of us that have genetics related to them here on the planet, that they're actually still here. They're just existing right outside. Because yeah. I felt like one time when I did this session with her, I was, they were talking to me about this pain that I had in my back and they were telling me that it was because they, they, how, I, they, how I lift my leg when I get into the car. How the heck do you know how I lift my leg when I get into the car unless you're right here and you can see what I'm doing? And they were right. I was doing that and I stopped doing yeah. it and my back stopped hurting. So yeah. I feel like that, and, and I actually feel like I was talking about this with a friend the other day. There are some of us who feel really close, like we're really about to break through something. And maybe that thing we're about to break to, through to is how to cloak ourselves in another density if we have to, if shit here gets too, you know what I mean? Like too crazy. And so I feel like they're trying to communicate with us to get us to, to stop it, to, you know, to, to, to correct this and fix things here. But also for those of us who are really paying attention, they're trying to teach us how to preserve ourselves if it gets to that. Right. Well, a couple of things come to mind. First of all, the two Hadadana were known for being able to raise a mist that hid themselves from sight. Ah. It was one of their primary powers. Okay. Um, that's number one. And number two, the first thing I thought of when you said ferns was, um, do you know what a bairn is? It's a Scottish no. word for baby. So if you took fairy and bairn, what would you come up with? Fairn, yeah. They, they also said fairy, about the fairy children. Are they, the children they, of the fairies? They, they talk about that. They like to, they sort of say they think of themselves like when they're trying to, because sometimes they'll let themselves be uncloaked for a second and it'll be like, they, they refer to themselves as like a rainbow kind of whirling dervish. Well, that's kind of fairy-like, what we think like a child-like thing, absolutely. The other thing, and I just almost, I just lost my train of thought. Where was I going with this? Um, oh, what? okay, well, let's move on and I'll, I'll remember. But um, yeah, no, absolutely. Oh, it keeps coming and going really fast. <laughs> anyway, well, yeah, that's very well, interesting. Yeah, the thing is, I do see the she as a, um, as a, 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 a as, as a, the next step down from the fae. They, they came from the fae. They are part fae and part what we would call human, mostly fae, really, the way that the gen genetics would have had to work back then in the gene pool, as I understand it. And the second part of the book is uh, Maria on the, on the she and um, wow. sacred sites that have to do with the she. So there's that. Yeah. Um, but there. yes, perception and the plasma is extremely, extremely important. They live, they just understand electromagnetics and the magnetic yeah. fields in a way that we don't understand anymore, you know? Yeah. And we need to, and we can. It's easy enough. I mean, easy enough. We just have to want to. This is the other thing that Maria does. She's, um, she really is a master dowser and an expert on the ley lines and ley energies. You guys need to get her separately when you can. Yeah, um, I, I'm really, I really into dowsing, yeah. Yeah, she's really important. So, um, <coughs> Randy, so anyway, that's, you know, the, the ley lines, they cross with the latitude lines. One of the things that I discovered was there's a point of, con of convergence of, I don't know, 20 or 30 really important ley lines in France, just south of CERN. They come mm -hmm. together sort of at a point, yeah? Yeah. Alais, I think, is the name of the, the town. A-L-A-I-S, yeah? Yes. Yeah, and when they, you yeah. put the latitude lines around like that, you get a potential for uh, this cone of sound. I mean, I can't, the, it's um, Pythagorean cone is what yeah. for it. And, and if you were someone who had the knowledge and the um, confidence in what you could do to raise energy at that point of convergence, you could make a Pythagorean tower easily. And there's a time, my opinion is that there was a time when that's how we function on this planet. That's how we made things, that's how we created things, yeah. that's how we use our voices to, uh, which we still do, we use our voices to create things, which is one of the reasons they won't shut us up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry guys <clears throat> and, uh, that one happens to be right on Sun's back door 
Yeah, that, well, that's interesting also. <laughs> they, so CERN, like to run their particle collider, they use a lot of enormous, very powerful crystals. So it's almost like they're using those kinds of powerful crystals like forest diamonds to create havoc here, just like they were speaking of it was done, you know, long, long ago during the time of Atlantis, I think. Yeah, it was kind of what they're, so I, I remember what I was going to say. They like, they're, they don't, uh, my knowledge of the Farians, they don't subscribe to any kind of particular um, eth ethnic or, 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 or sort of spiritual, like, a, any, like they're not of a certain religious faith or a certain, they don't talk about being of a certain ethnic race, but they like the concepts, the way they try and explain things is actually they use a lot of the concepts of Taoism. Yeah, that's becoming very clear as well. Okay, um, I was wondering about that, yeah. Yeah, one of the things that that hasn't been investigated, it will be investigated strangely enough in my the next okay. chapter in the workbook on food because the Taoist way of, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, this is one of the things that's going to be investigated um, at length that it will be attached to food and nutrition. And that just has to do with... Um, laying the poisons on us to keep it's just another facet of what's what's been done to us to try to keep us boxed in but isn't it amazing how we keep leaking out yeah if you if you like i will if you as long as you return to me i will send you this book but you can read it before you move on to your third book the, the farons that'd be great the, yeah and yeah. then also the woman i told you <laughs> had had a you know an autoimmune disease who healed with can the whole candida thing She's, yeah. she's now a well-known nutritionist who wrote a very interesting health book called The Candida Cure. And I bet you would probably play into some of what you're talking about. So if you like, I'll send them both to you. Probably. Thank you. That would yeah. be great. I'm getting ready to do some experimenting myself. This is something that Randy and I've talked about for years as well. And I don't make a secret of it, even though it makes me sound like a lunatic to most people out there. Um, we, we have 24,000 units of biophotonic energy flowing through our body each and every day. The body, the human body is the filter. And frankly, that's how we sustain ourselves. And all this other nonsense that we've been trained to put in our body, that's something else altogether. It's not food and it doesn't sustain us. So, but we, but we live in an extremely, extremely powerful belief system. And um, buying into that can kill you if you're not ready for that. Do you know what I mean? So um, one of the things I'm getting ready to do, which is a step, is uh, vegetarian paleo. Paleo, because that gets rid of all the grains and it gets rid of all yep. the beans and it just gets rid of all, a lot of the junk. Um, it's a step. It's a step on on the way, which for me will probably be a lifetime journey. But anyway, yeah, I'd love to have some of that stuff. That yeah, I, I I eat her diet. I, I'm not. I eat her diet. I'm not a vegetarian. I have been before and I may be again. But I eat a diet for candida. I don't eat any gluten, any sugar, any dairy, any soy, or anything artificial. And I, as much organic stuff as I can. And I juice and I take particular supplements. And it is almost like, me and Randy were having this interesting conversation the other day about how I work sometimes, one of my jobs is merchandising and I work in different stores and I look in people's food cart. And yeah. that's in their food cart would be anything that, not only would it be, I would I never eat it, but it's not even things that I consider food. So right. if I'm eating something, if they're eating something that is not food to me and I'm eating something completely else, at what point do we even become like almost a separate species or a separate kind of physical so entity? There's so much to think about, man. There's so much to think about. And this is how Buckminster Fuller came up for me today. Did you know he was on a liquid diet? He's one of the, those, those people who just drank nutrients. Yeah, I, like, I, you know, I, I drink, I do a lot of juicing, green juices in particular, and I actually just got my own like high quality juicer. and. It, it, when you drink it right after you make it as opposed to in a bottle from someone, it feels totally different. And I've actually felt like, well, I could probably go a long period of time just drinking juice, like exactly. or, or doing juice, all, having just one meal a day, drink, drinking juice the rest of the time. Um, it's very interesting. Um, so yeah, I actually do think that we can do a lot to uh, alter ourselves from the inside out and stop worrying so much. I mean, you need to worry about what's coming from the outside. But I think that there's a lot we can do from the inside to change things or save things for ourselves. This is right. probably one of the most dangerous conversations you can have. Yes, it is. Emily, yeah. Emily and I have I been kill. talking about <laughs> dangerous conversations we need to have. There's a couple of them. Yeah. This is one of them because this hits yeah. everybody. You know, people can disagree about religion and sexuality and all of these other subjects. But when it comes down to food, and all of a sudden, as you pointed out, Kara, this is a con. We've been told 
we require what? Well, the FDA says you need this much every day. They used to have the food pyramid. Right. Isn't that interesting? It was a fucking right. of course, it's pyramid. Always a pyramid. <laughs> and, it's always a pyramid. That's right. <laughs> And so we, we've been led to believe that we need all of these things and our culture has is so steeped in, I'll just say it, this bloody culture of carnism, yep. which yes. is, you know, I would say this is something, this is like coming off heroin. You do not want to do this without proper preparation spiritually because it demands more of you than you think i know i've done it i've stripped meat from my diet a couple yeah. times i i know what it's like the cravings yeah. to kick in because you're dealing with you're dealing with the adrenal gland you're dealing with uh your met metabolic system at such a at such a low level but I'm, I'm also doing a series with dr shamil asher called the triunity series which mm -hmm. very much goes into the spiritual aspects of a culture that's based on the sacrifice of fellow beings on the planet, the animals. Yeah. And what that does to us energetically as a planet, as a species, and the spiritual consequences of all this. So, you know, this keeps coming up. This idea Until that this matters. Yeah. Until we stop I think participating in this group of sacrifice of the other kingdoms, we yeah. have problems. I, I can I think about it every day. Like I'm not I'm not a vegan or a vegetarian at this point, but I'd say for the last year almost, I think about it almost every day. And I guess the pro, the I I used to be a vegetarian, and then when I started eating meat again, I felt so much better. I've changed some other things in my diet now too, so maybe it's time to experiment again. But yeah. there isn't a day in the last year that it doesn't come up for me as a, as a moral issue. I spend probably at least thirty minutes a day thinking about it. Just that, you know what I mean? Which tells me we I have to do yeah. something about it. And I think there's a lot of other people. We're doing the same thing. Yeah. yeah. But you know what? The one thing I wanted to mention before we move on or anything um, that Randy said is the most one of the most dangerous conversations that we can yeah. start having is because if the food industry falls, everything that's wrong with this planet will fall. Yeah. Yeah. Good. That's a great point. Yeah. That's a fact. And think about from if you follow that this this train of thought from from one to the inevitable end, those food industries fall. Then everything that's wrong yeah. with this freaking planet will fall if yeah if everybody stops eating those things in the that are in the grocery store that i don't eat then there'll be no business for those people to do and that stuff right. all the transport this stuff it really it is that's the house of cards man well what if we only eat light yeah really what if that's all we eat how much more does that eliminate i mean it's ever, yeah. it will all fall of course that's why they're blocking the sun is because they don't want us to eat light so. yeah <laughs> but you know what i have to say as long as you brought up this idea of blocking the sun, that was the very first thing that came to me when I first started writing and thinking about all of this, getting between us and the sun and what an esoteric, where that leads esoterically as a crime. Yeah. But you know what? I listened to Sophia Smallstorm the other day. Yeah. Um, she ta has taught me so much over the years, a little mighty powerhouse. And she was talking about the antiseptic nature of the sun and the septic nature of the moon. And yeah. that yeah, and that if the sun yeah. this is huge. energy cannot hit the planet, we're just the planet's just going to get more and more and we're more. in sepsis, yeah. Yes. So that's getting between the septic nature and a septic nature of the sun for us and for the planet as well, which is something people I don't think people think about either. But the sun is an antiseptic. This is also one of the reasons why I think this time of year you see so many people sick. And why you also see mortality rates skyrocket. It's almost like, I know, we talk about the ritual, and let's face it, George Michael just passed off the planet, apparently. Carrie Fisher, two hours. Carrie Fisher just died, too, did you see? Yeah. These successions of deaths that seem to kick in right after solstice. Yeah. Some of that may be sacrifice, but some of it is the septic nature of darkness. I mean, yeah. personally, the sickest I've ever been in my life, I nearly died, was three years ago. All of it occurred in that window between the fall equinox and the solstice. Mm -hmm. I got mm -hmm. progressively sicker and sicker and sicker and weaker. Right, right. And my soul, actually, my, my, the beginning of what was supposed to be my healing came on solstice. But there's this whole nocturnal aspect lunar aspect 
and what the sun does to heal us and the energies of it. We don't even know what the sun is. We don't know how it functions. Everything that science tells us, I believe, is an error about the sun. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. Randy, I can't help but say to this to you. Every time, I, every time you're on camera, you got this Christmas tree thing going in the back, right? It's not it's a Christmas a tree. But what is that? It's a constellation of some sort. Yeah. Did you know? What is it, Randy? It's actually I, lights that are just strewn into one of my plants in the back. No, it's a constellation, dude. Okay. <laughs> Randy is coming to us. For, this Every is time I'm you come sorry, on that's why I'm, I'm, I'm Lord of the Star Fields now. Too, this, so. this is off planet radio, Kara. He's coming from us to, <laughs> right. to a spaceship. Come on. <laughs> when you look at this later, I want you to look over that. Because yeah. you've got a constellation behind you. Yeah, it's, it looks like a, like a dipper of some sort or something like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we got to figure it out. No, <laughs> it's shadow language, dude. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, another yeah. subject. Very interesting. Yeah. Shadow yeah. language. We've spoken about it here on the show before. Absolutely. The way yeah, they the way, the way they speak about things is as important as what they're actually speaking. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes, in fact, probably. The most interesting and intriguing thing about language is that it's loaded in layers. Mm -hmm. We speak it and it's loaded in layers. And um, that's, that's part of the magic, you know? There's a surface layer to everything we say and there are other layers underneath it. And, and we all have these moments all the time when <clears throat> something shifts and we go, oh, that's what that means. And it just becomes something completely different. And you go down another layer and down another layer and down another layer. That's the magnificent thing about the, the spoken language, right? It, yeah. It's loaded with magic and power. And I know Randy wants to talk about getting our power back and our magic. I don't know if, if I'm premature in saying that, but this is one of the ways that we can do it is to really start thinking about it's not, but it's not just about thinking about the language as a as a as an objective thing. It's outside ourselves. Um, we we're gonna uh, we're gonna start working on um, connecting ourselves to our power. We have been trained to believe that everything happens outside us. Yep. Everything um, happens yeah. without our volition, without our conscious yeah. power, yeah. without. I mean, it's all out there. It's one of the reasons. Um, <laughs> what was it? <clears throat> one of the things I'm trying to avoid doing when I'm, I'm putting together a series of workshops that will develop and grow, obviously, as, as we play through them and, and people participate in them and add to them and all of that, but um, it's, they're about, the titles are the sovereign imagination, meaning I, there's a lot that goes on, there's a lot that goes into that, but um, primarily it would be ownership of your own power, ownership of your own imagination, your own private, you know, ray that you can, that you aim out, your will essentially ends up being your will that you aim out into the world. It's one of the ways that that actually got diverted is um, when people started talking about things like the, called the power of attraction. Um, and, and manifesting doesn't have, in my opinion, as much to do with the law of attraction, which means that everything exists outside yourself and outside yeah. your own power, I, and then you bring it to yourself. It's not what it is in here. Now. It's in here. You're making it. And see, we've got to switch that perception. It's not the law of attraction. It's the law of, of magic. You are yeah. making these things. I'm age in. So manifesting isn't about sucking things toward you, like some, you know, it exists outside yourself and you're about pushing it out pushing it from inside of you out so it's about about experience. Yeah. It, is. it is it's about manifest consciously being aware that you have you have the power to do that and you're doing it all the time and this is the one thing that they want to keep us from knowing right there well i'll back you up just a little bit because you you danced at this this idea of language is an internal process we are constantly processing in our background a system of thought that's not expressed as verbal language. It's our own internal code. We don't even decode our own internal codes for the most part until right. they begin to come in to the visual space at the back of the head. Then they move forward 
and they come out here, we're in the prefrontal cortex, and then we can begin to push verbal out. But what's lost in the translation of all of that is the difference between writing what in software is called pure code, which means you're writing real close to machine level. Well, translate, you know, just extend the metaphor. At machine level, you're actually thinking symbolically, which goes into some things that you and Maria both touch on in this book. The idea of these symbolic expressions of language, which are much more powerful than anything that we can encode and, and verbalize. Right. There is power within the codes, power within the symbols. Yeah. There's power within everything. And the only thing we have to do is remember that we're, we are driving that cart. We've got the reins. That's, you know, we, we are manifesting all of that. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that's important, I think, to start experimenting with and working with, Randy, is the idea that our thoughts are not our own. Okay. Oh, totally. Yeah. Being so bombarded. No, it is true. Yeah. So many centuries we've been so bombarded from the outside. Okay. That uh, we don't, we can't tell our thoughts from anything else that's going on in the universe. So how could we possibly consciously acknowledge or, or um, listen to or act upon our own codes? Now, the good thing, the, the truly miraculous thing about human beings is that we're still creating even though it's kind of a runaway story. We are. Runaway. We are. But All we have these. The time, man. Everything outside us is something that we made. If you can see it, you can think it, you bloody well made it. Remember that. However, there's so much more to stepping into. There's, that's not, that's the unconscious part of what we do. It's still our miracle, but the conscious part of what we do is what we will do when we can um, turn off the noise. And we can start really hearing. That's another thing that I'm going to be working on is, is, is enabling people through a very conscious meditation that was given to us by Rudolf Steiner to shut out the noise. You know, you know Steiner's work, Randy. Yeah, I'm you know, reading it again the right first now. Exercise. The first exercise is I even, I even make people practice this when I'm giving lectures now because I think it's so important just to give them that tool. I'm gonna give you something right now, you know, and here's how you do it. And I'm gonna give you an example and it's audience participation. Close your eyes, I'm gonna walk you through this under, you know, assuming that, you know, that this one object is what you chose. Let me show you how to do this, okay? I'm walk and I walk them through it and then I walk them backwards. And I say, if you can do that five minutes a day, not only will the archons get bored and leave you the hell alone, yeah. But you will be able to, I mean, because really, five minutes yeah. is all it takes. But you will be able to start separating your thoughts from all the noise, man. And if you can, that, that's a good place to start, Randy. That's a good place to start. Separate. It's a great place to start, yeah. yeah. The first place you have to start is recognizing exactly what you just said there about all of these background interference patterns, the monkey mind. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with P.D. Ospensky. Who was yes, Washington. yes. Okay. He was so, so much in Gurdjieff somehow, wasn't he? He was, he was, a, he was a student of Gurdjieff. He eventually kind of went off. But a lot of what Ospensky's work was about was teaching his students to distinguish the alien thought patterns in their own head and how to basically quiet the mind enough to allow these things to arise to the surface and simply disappear, vaporize, let them go, and understand that the more you got close to the stillness, the core of your being, mm -hmm. there was less noise. It's like a signal, signal to noise ratio thing where yeah. your best signal is right at the still point. Right, right. Yeah. And he yeah. must have, you know, he spent 40 years and he pissed most of his students off. I, they, they couldn't take it because he was so brutal about this. But good yes. teachers are extremists. And that, yeah. that's kind of, it kind of goes into this whole thing of what I've been saying for a long time is that you have to be still. You have to simply sit down, learn how to breathe, learn how to shut everything down, let all of the chatter, all the mechanisms of the brain fade into the background 
And there's mm -hmm. this place where you begin to get the imagery, the, the, what Emily talks about in terms of even the sacred geometry and things like that. Right. And to communicate on a very high subliminal level. It's amazing how the masters all talked about the same thing yeah. in a way. And that is getting your, your thoughts back, getting sovereignty over your own thoughts. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, go ahead, Emily. It's hard work. Like I went through um, trying to, I at a certain point realized that a lot of my thoughts were not my own or they were, so, there were some of my thoughts being intermingled with something else and then becoming something that was not what they originally were. And I, it, it took quite a bit of work and, and really looking at yourself and being honest with yourself. But I got to where I'm able to understand what are my, it's not that the other noise doesn't come in, but I know what it is and I know it's not mine. And so you pay less attention to it and you can push it out. I, it, and hopefully you keep working on it and eventually you don't have the noise anymore. But I think it, it is, you know, I think a lot of people don't even start the process because they think, well, I'll never be able to get rid of all those thoughts. The, the important thing is to identify which ones are truly coming from you, the real you, the inner you, and which ones, I mean, we have shit coming to us from electronics and Wi-Fi and, and you know, all these kinds of nonsense. But there is, if you pay close, close attention, there is a rhythm to your own thoughts that is different than those, right? And, and, and those ones, once you identify them, they're the same all the time. They might yes. present themselves differently, but they have the same staccato. They have the same geometry to them if they're sort of visual. If you close your eyes and you sort of see the sound instead of, it, they, they present themselves in the same pattern over and over. And it actually isn't that hard to start identifying that. And once you identify, like now they're completely separate. Like I know which ones are what, what, it's not confusing anymore. And the next step is to make them go away, but it is so important. It's right. so important because even, when, even if you have a small amount of that, it's weaving itself into you and it's completely distorting the good thing, that, like the, the innate goodness that you're sort of trying to project. So, well, take, the, take the metaphor of a radio receiver for a minute, you know, and I always go back to this because it's, Kind of my fond boyhood memory of building radio sets using crystals. But those crystals inside of a radio did something very important. They set the amplitude for that radio receiver to receive the proper signals and to block everything else out, including the static and background noise. Right. Or what I call the voice of the alien, which is basically all of the odd energetic. I watched myself go through this this morning. I did it. I sat here. And I'm, I'm going through conniption fits and I'm flying around and I'm, I'm, I'm being crazy and I'm doing all this inside my head. Wait a minute, stop it. Sit down for a minute, breathe. Because you just, you took one alien thought and you went on a tangent with it. And all of a sudden, you're in anxiety, you're stressed. Yeah. You, now you have cravings. Now you want something. You want to smoke, eat, rub, steam, whatever, <laughs> some substance to calm your ass down when it all started with this one thought that dodged yep. in your brain and then fanned out like mosquitoes. It's unbelievable. Yeah, and we can all feel it with each yeah. other, right? It's been that way. I know, yeah. you know, I hate to use, but I always do use Randy as an example. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> But that's because, but that's because, that's because, generally speaking, one of us is, only one of us is crazy at a time. And that's the true. Other, and can, the other one can check in and, and get some, you know, reality check. That ain't been happening lately. We both been crazy. <laughs> It's fortunately, fortunately I'm not crazy, so I'll keep track of both. Emily's my grounder. Yeah, it's probably We're going to take a break here for a couple of minutes, uh, kind of kick back, and uh, let's see. Emily usually is able to pull something out of her trick bag. <laughs> so I wasn't sure what we were exactly going to get into tonight, guys, but the things we've been talking about have given me some great ideas, so I will select a very cool track for you and some interesting images to go with it. Get back and enjoy. We'll be back in a few. We'll be back. back.
has been going on for a good thousand, two thousand years is meant to divorce us from knowing who we are. Yep. And everything that we are is embodied in the Fey. That is who we are. They were, they were, and we are magical, mighty, mighty beings. And I will always contend that the I've said this a million times, the imagination is the translator between the morphogenic field, which is pure potential, and the material plane. And we are unique in the universe in our ability to do that. We are the only ones who can do it. We are precious and rare and almost uncontainable, which, which is why there's this full spectrum fire hose turned on us all the time yeah. Yeah. because we can't they can't knock us down and keep us down yeah. but they have slapped us silly to the point where we don't remember why we just keep getting back up but we're not really sure why you know um but that's 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 really what it's all about is divorcing us from any understanding of who we really are how mighty and rare and perfect and magical we are you know and um, it's one of the reasons I think that uh, it's very, very important. It's just like when people ask you who the enemy is, when people ask you who they is, we can find out who they is by finding out who we are because yeah. they, is who, they is who we are not. Yeah. They is who we are not. Right now, I tend to, to gravitate toward the artificial intelligence um, theory right now of what's at the apex. Uh, Back up and say that again. You blipped out there for a minute. You, yeah. I gravitate toward the artificial intelligence yeah. theory of what's at the apex of the enemy. That could change our understandings of that could change. It could turn out that that's also just a tool, you know, but mm -hmm. the, the reality is I think that we need to spend more time discovering who we are and stepping into that than buying into all the distractions yeah. that they're offering mm -hmm. us. Now, it's one of the things I just did a chemtrails, I just did a combined chemtrails uh, dangerous imagination lecture in San Francisco and Luma. And um, one of the things that I'm saying now is that, you know, the list of what's coming down on us from the skies is long and long and horrifying and, and all of these amazing things. But if you just took a half a dozen of them, put them in a paper bag, closed your eyes and pulled one of them out, that one should be horrifying enough to get you <clears> up <throat> off the walls. 
and 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 make you absolutely just outraged absolutely outraged it's more important to understand why we're not outraged it's more yep. important to understand the rest of it which is this giant trance that we're in right now and taking that apart in pieces is reverse engineering and you try to you try to always pull the pieces out because the whole thing comes together really easily and then all of a sudden we're asleep again because the whole piece is brilliantly put together do you know and we're so used to it that you know that's then we just go right back to sleep so pulling each piece out and understanding what each piece is about I think is the best way to understand what's being done to us. I don't try to spend a lot of time on the details of, of aerosol engineering anymore. Any one thing, sulfur dioxide, you know, David Keith just decided he was gonna shroud, right? David Keith wrote a freaking book, okay, about shrouding this planet in sulfur dioxide and why that was a good idea, okay? <laughs> Who knows that? I mean, it's just absolutely insane, and yet we're sitting there listening and we're like, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. Oh, so yeah, just I would just need another ten thousand dead every year, but maybe it would be a good thing. That's insane. It's lunacy. Absolutely it's lunacy. Insane. Yeah. It's lunacy, but we're sitting there. That's because it's all becoming normalized. Like this okay? sounds of, yeah. This sounds crazy sometimes when I say it to people and I, I'm sort of joking, but really not. Like, first of all, like, how did anybody decide, oh, I, I'm, I, I'm God and I'm just going to spray the sky. I, I've decided, but here's the thing. It's, it's like, okay, do it. If you want to do that, do it where you are, but don't do it anywhere that I go. Cause I didn't agree to that. So how, I don't understand how 7 billion people on the planet have all somehow been convinced that they agreed that, you know, like, like this, that this is a two, four people, seven people, 25 people can decide for them that, that, you know, this is basically bug spray. I don't want bug spray sprayed in my house because it's toxic. It's, yeah. They're basically spraying us like we're bugs. And I say the same thing to people. I'm like, I don't, I don't feel bound by the constitution because I didn't sign it. So I don't, it's the same kind of idea. Like, why do people feel like they, they, that this thing that they didn't agree to was okay. Like if Bill Gates and David Keith want to spray, let them spray over their yard and they can stay there and suck it all up and the earth can be right. under their yard how they want it to be. But stop it everywhere that I go. Stop. That's, that's the thoughts are not our own part of this. Those yeah. The, meme, the memes that are going around in our head, the hamster wheels in our head all the time, around and around and around and around and around, prevents us from having any kind of logical or rational or even um, self-preservative thinking about any of this kind of stuff. And the really important thing right now to remember as well is that we're part of the bridge generation. You're not quite old enough, Emily. I can tell you that right now. But Randy and I are part of the bridge generation. And they're just waiting for us to die. Because we know before the before and the after. They, yeah. I'm, I'm, a few weeks, I'm a few weeks older than I look. So I, 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 you know, I, I'm old enough to remember that, that it used to be different than it is now. You know, okay. like I, I remember when the sun was yellow, right? <laughs> and when the TV was black and white, my uh, the first TV I remember was black and white. So I'm not okay. that. <laughs> so you're holding up pretty well then. Anyway. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so it's imperative that we get this done now. And uh, part of it isn't just describing the problem anymore. It's about illuminating the lies so we can see the truth, which is the same thing as saying, define who we are so we know who they are, right? Yeah. Um, and then reverse engineer the pieces to the best of our ability and keep hammering away at that. But just as important is to reimagine the human being. And he's saying, I mage in. We are the magicians. We are magic. We are the magician. We are the first card in the arcana, right? And um, it's just as important to, to focus our will as it is to throw up our hands in fear and, and, and loathing and panic when we understand the, the true depth of what's going on right now. Um, yes, yes, absolutely do that. But stop doing that and start doing something about that. Yeah. And realize it's not necessarily joining protest lines. No. It's about focusing your laser will imagination in the way that you are meant to do. And I think we all need to work real hard at, at uh, experimenting and working on uh, empowering ourselves in that way. I even want to find a different word than empowering. I mean, we all talk about empowering, blah, blah, I think, blah. I think blah, it's blah, blah. embodying. I think we need to embody that which we want to be. Right. I don't know. Randy's pretty good at this. What do we call it? 
it's, it's you know. <laughs> Almost every terminology you come up with is going to either become a catchphrase or some sort yeah. of slogan. You know, let's do a T-shirt, put out, hand out some button. <laughs> mm -hmm. What I see, what I see happening though, is much more subtle. It's more like it's more like fields of energy separating right now, and it's a consciousness level thing. Yeah. Um, in a sense. We live in a divided world. It looks to me like in some way, consciousness is now separating out the predator. Yeah. Not that we're not impacted by it, but the first advantage with the predator has been psychological. It has been what you were saying about who gave them permission to do this? Who signed right. off on this? Well, once you revoke permission and you begin to act sovereign, sovereign imagination, mm -hmm. now you're generating a dynamic from yourself which has its own field, its own force. Right. Right. It will gravitationally seek like-minded gravitational fields until it gains mass. I, this, mm -hmm. this is a simple physics, right. but applied to metaphysics so okay. what we're doing is we've put energetically we've put messages words pictures concepts which now are beginning to gather energy and gather their own field um can we i can't go blow the planes out of the sky that are that are chemtrailing any more than i can stop right. the advance of the military industrial pro projects or stop MK Ultra or stop all of the other bullshit that's been going on that's all social conditioning and mind control. But what I can do is I can stop at my own field first and I can find other people to begin to impel into that field, which then creates a new gravitational field and a new consciousness. So in effect, what happens at some point is we spin off and we split the world. But not right. quite the way people think. Not, not the Dolores, the Dolores Cannon way. No, no, not that. But you know, conceptually, <laughs> we're you know, like the not the Dolores. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Did she say that? <laughs> so yeah, when you were talking about the, the sovereign, sovereign imagination too, I was thinking one of the things people can start to do because so much of sovereignty is being self-sufficient and us not needing to rely on these people for things anymore. So take, let's start trying to take everything back to the level where we're doing as much of it for ourselves as we can. Like just the thing that I talked about earlier, going from buying juice to now I'm making my own, that feels right. better. And the next right. step would be grow some of those fruits and vegetables that I put into my juice myself. So right. as many things as we can take back to the base level and do it as much of it as we can ourselves or make sure that we know the people around us who are doing those things for us, I think that's super important. That's something we can all do. And support people who are doing it because yeah. part of this is interdependence in a good right. way. It's the gears right. that move like this, lockstep. Mm -hmm. You know, to find people who do what you don't do, yeah. but you contribute to them. It kind of goes back to the show that we did earlier this year, Emily, with- um, Derek Bros. With Derek Bros. You should, do, you know, do you know who Derek Rose is, Kara? No. He's, he has a, he, so he has a, um, a website called The Conscious Resistance, and he is a um, very outspoken uh, voluntarist, anarchist, but he, he's, very, um, he's a very salt of the earth kind of guy. He's an independent writer. He writes for anti-media and a bunch of other things, but he's, he and his friends started basically, he lives in this, what he calls the free thinker house. He's a community house. builder, basically. Yeah, and, yeah. and he they started these freedom cells where they're getting groups of eight to 10 people together and teaching each other everything they basically know and trying to do as many things for themselves as they can. And then hopefully other people will start groups that size. And then those groups can interact with each other. It's a really good idea. He has a website, freedomcells.org. It's pretty interesting. That's good guerrilla thinking there, right? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Absolutely. See, I mean, things, really good things are going on. They really are going on. And it's our job to make sure everybody knows that these really good things are going on. The other thing is, I think it's a really important as well, is to these take these bits, reverse engineer it, 
you know, and they get really uncomfortable and start kicking people out of bed, you know, yeah. boom, you're up, you're out. I don't care anymore. It's one of the things that I say is um, I don't really care to hear all this stuff about how we're all in the, exactly in the place that we're supposed to be in. I'm not, <laughs> that's just okay. But you know what? It's not okay. I'm not subscribing to that crap anymore. I'm kicking people out of bed. And one of the ways to do that is to tell them the most outrageous stuff that's going on that they're doing to us, you know, really outrageous stuff like the timeline, you know? Yeah. So it's just, and give and, and hit them hard and fast because I promise you, you know, the people who want to keep that secret are, are walking in lockstep with us trying to, um, you know, sugarcoated and diverted and change it so that it sounds like the truth, but it's not really the truth. And it's exactly how they want to spin it. But, you know, yeah. it is, it is just as important because that to get back on, on the subject that, or the, the, the track that we were just following to take things in hand, to take things in hand and yeah. make, write your, rewrite your own story, write your own story, guys. You can do that. You really can do that. It's hard. It's hard because we're so used to being babysat. We've been trained to be very, very dependent, but it can be done and it can be done. It's hard. It's, it's simple, but it's not easy. I guess that's the best way to put it, right? Yeah, it, well, that's, we, we're so used to thinking that everything that has value has to be very complicated, that we have right. completely divorced ourselves from, from any kind of like simple living or simple thought, simple right. behavior. Right. And the answers lie in that. We have, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. I do. I do. And I think that, um, yeah, so uh, way back at the beginning of this train of thought was the idea that the Fae are very much here and palpable if we want, if they want us, <laughs> what a stupid thing to say. I was going to say if they want, to, they want to us to palpate them, right? If they, want us to, if they want us to know that they're there. They do want us they to do. know that they're there. The evidence is everywhere. It's everywhere. You just got to believe it. Just gotta believe it. Don't do the Walt Disney crap, okay? <laughs> don't, don't buy that stuff. Do not buy that stuff. That's not what it is. And I'll tell you something else. It's shaking up the megalithic community just a little bit too. Yeah. Because it's not what their party line is. I'll tell you something, and that I'm not accusing the megalithic community when I say this. It's go, just, go, let's explain this to us a little bit. Segue, okay? But when Maria and I were writing this book, um, <clears throat> hmm. Both her her laptop and her regular computer were hacked, and a bunch of stuff was, was stolen. I went through three computers and um, two thumb drives that I could couldn't access all of a sudden for no reason, trying to get this book out. Okay, so there was a lot, a lot of interference. It's very much. I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's very much like when other pyramids were being discovered around the world and the Egyptian establishment started trying to throw a monkey wrench into everything and they still do they still fire professors who buy into the pyramids anywhere else in the world because it's bucks you know the way they've got it set up isn't just um throwing the wool over our eyes it's serious serious money okay so the way that they have everything set up all of these worlds are distinctly male as well, strangely enough, which yeah. I hate to say that because I'm always, I'm a, a big proponent of bringing back the sacred masculine too. Yeah. I don't think that we need to autopilot this difference between men and women. I don't like that. I think that's also bullshit. But um, the reality is that there are some women breaking in to this stuff. Maria is one mm -hmm. of them. Sylvia Ivanova is another yeah. one. But man, they get hassled. I'll tell you that right now. And once well, once it's we, been an old boy school for for it centuries. It is. That's what it is. And they have their theories, you know. And I honestly wonder, in this case, how many people, how many men would have been brave enough to start talking about the Fae as a reality? You know, as a I've never heard. I've never heard. The first person I ever heard it from. <laughs> Was a woman that the only people I ever really hear talk about it are women. That's right. Yeah. That's right. They don't. Yeah. It's one of the reasons it got lumped in. It's one of the reasons somebody came out and said, "Eh, demons, gin, archons, fae." Well, look at the Adam. Look at the negative etymology behind fae, fairy, 
I mean, they're not good. It is a stereotype yeah. to refer to gay males as fairies and yeah. you know, fae. And to assign, yeah. Tinkerbell has always been played by a female. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what's yeah. up with that? I'm like, it's, I thought, but well, what they've done is they've ultra feminized it to the exclusion of balance, Emily. And yeah. I've been talking about this a lot lately in terms of gender issues that have to do with the LGB community, the right. you know, all of that, that everything veers towards the radical of one side rather than trending towards right. balance, which is the ideal. Right, which is another way to confuse everything, isn't it? Right, exactly. I mean, it fundamentally confuses us on every yeah. level that there is. Keep us, try to keep us as off balance as human as possible. So, let me pull you off here because I'm still that's okay. Right. No. Talk a little bit about your collaboration with Maria Wheatley and how that worked and, and you kind of sparked off of each other in some very interesting ways in all of this. Yeah, we really did. Uh, Maria is somebody I met when I was working for The People's Voice. Um, that's, I, that was Ike's channel. Um, I was developing a show of my own, um, It's a Married People, and I, someone brought her to me, someone who, gosh, like Gary Evans, I think his name was, he was also um, into Megalith, and he was also representing some people with Maria, and asked me if I wanted to interview her. So I drove out to Avebury to interview her, and she took us on a tour around Avebury and all the, you know, all the healing stones and things like that. And um, the minute that she and I started talking, we just kind of started um, not finishing each other's sentences necessarily, because that's you know, I mean, that's really great when people are like that, but um, it was almost like we kind of had epiphanies, uh, played off each other having epiphanies walking down the road, you know, she would show me a map of um, part of Avebury, and I'd say, oh God, is that serious? And she'd look at me, I mean, like the star, the double, the double uh, sun, and, and she'd look at me like she'd never thought of that before. She'd go, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Is that serious for you? I mean, it was one of those things, you know? So that's how the relationship developed. It's obviously been a very important um, friendship. And, and um, Maria is actually a master dowser and one of the guardians of Avebury. And she is an absolute expert in sacred sites and ley lines. She's also the, the daughter of one of, apparently, I'm so embarrassed, I don't know who this guy is. She's the daughter Dennis of one Wheatley. of the most important occultists in the world, Dennis Wheatley. Yeah. Um, I recently actually uh, contacted somebody in Totnes, it's a friend of mine, who's an anthroposophist connected with the school down there to see if I could get some space to try out a workshop and mentioned that it was Maria. And she said to me, I haven't heard that name in a long time, but that is how a lot of people found their way into the occult, including a lot of anthroposophists, which I had not known. Mm. Anyway, so she has this connection. Um, Maria is not allowed in any of the churches in Avery. They won't let her in. <laughs> oh, I want to be friends with her then. I want to be friends right? with her. <laughs> she love Maria. She's not allowed in any of the but churches. But let me correct this. When you said a cultist, in yeah, the case well, of her father, right. we're, we're talking about a cultist that were basically working in hidden knowledge. Yeah. And yeah. Dennis Wheatley worked in a field which basically was motivational mm -hmm. so well, a lot of his, his applied knowledge had to do with people being inspired motivated and being able to take back their lives and isn't that interesting considering yeah. what we're talking about right now yeah okay. exactly one of the reasons that this woman a couple of weeks ago said isn't it interesting that that name's coming up again right now, you know? Anyway, so, um, and Maria's dad taught her everything she knows about dowsing, apparently. He was amazing, and the ley lines. Anyway, so Maria and I did this interview, um, and uh, then we ended up on the same panels a couple of times. She was connected with bases. She has a lot more patience <laughs> with people than I do, I have to admit. She's, um, she's a very good soul, let me put it that way. And she will tolerate people when I've, when I've decided not to tolerate them anymore. Anyway, she's a groovy person and she knows uh, this is our connection. And she's turned to me one day 
she turned to me one day, Randy, and she said to me, you, you can find the Celtic heart. And I went, what the heck is the Celtic heart? <laughs> what are you talking about? What are you actually talking about? She said, you, you can find it. I know you can. And I, I thought, okay, I just kind of parked that. You know what I mean? It's like one of those things that people say. And then all of a sudden, we were embarked on this project together and we had it on the back burner because we were both busy. And then she realized I had some time off. And so she said, let's do it right now. And um, we're going to be doing workshops together and, and we're going to do uh, a bunch of them in Ireland in April. Um, we're going to be climbing around in megaliths because I'll tell you something, Maria can get me into places that nobody else can. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be climbing around under Ireland for a while. Yeah. I heard that's where there, I heard there's lots of interesting stuff under the green hills of Ireland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. That's a lot of people say that's where all of this come, all of it. That's where, it the is whole where it all comes from. from. Yeah. It is where it all comes from. And I will tell you, I'm not going to name any names because I shouldn't, because I never know when I'm going to run into people. But there are people who are very, very big in this uh, business right now who are kind of keeping an eye on me right now and what I have to say about Ireland. People whose business it has been to, to, to talk about Ireland, let me put it that way. You mean so like from a I, gatekeeper perspective, basically? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's up. No, it, well, it kind of is. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because, you know, I have kind of an interest in Celtic, and even that term, let's just say, has been muddied a bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know. And I'll name a name here because Michael Tesorian has said that. Celtic is basically an, a bastard name as a result of colon, colon, colonialization. But I, I think the Celtic culture holds together in a way that, as opposed to Ire, Ireland as a geographic or a nation state, Celtic mm -hmm. works for me, so I use it. I don't really yeah. give him what Michael Tesorian says anyway, so. Um, <laughs> what? There's there's a lot of um, there's a lot hidden in that land. Yes. There's a lot of mystery, yeah. and there's a reason why, because I am one third Irish. That bloodline, for some particular reason, in certain combinations, is very highly sought after by, shall we say, it is. certain agencies, certain yeah. extraterrestrials. Yeah because of the mystery and because of the bloodlines themselves. Well, and look, look at the way they, they try to, and it's probably some sort of mocking of fake kinds of things by this idea of the leprechaun and how silly they make the leprechaun seem look, right? Yeah. Like it's the bastardization of the fae or the, the fairy, yeah. It's, you know, so that's all, is whatever it? anybody in Ireland, all they think about is uh, uh, gold and leprechauns and potatoes. And that's what they've, made, they've, that's what they've turned it into. And beer. Absolutely. Yeah. And Lucky Charms cereal, right? right? Yeah, stupid leprechaun. Yeah. Me lucky Charms. No, right. no, oh, it is. Oh, oh. Lucky Charms. <laughs> that is um, that is a place of origin. There's no question about that. It, it is a mighty, mighty, mighty place of origin. Um, it's one of those things where we really have to jettison all the bullshit that surrounds it, yep. and identify what exactly what is bullshit. I was going to say um, a bit a little while ago that um, Tinkerbell's actually an MK Ultra um, Appalachian, isn't it? Isn't it? It's, a, it's a program. Sure, there's it's that kind program, of program, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there's a look at, I mean, I mean, it's just endless, endlessly fascinating, endlessly fascinating to get back to the bottom of all this. As far as the Celtic stuff goes, it does extend to Brittany and France. I know that, but I think it came from Ireland. It came from Ireland. It came from Ireland. Like you said earlier, too, <laughs> this was a world culture. Yes. And we have to remember that. The connections, yes. you can begin to make the connections again here in the States. If you mm -hmm. just go look at Ohio, West Virginia, the mound building cultures, and then yeah. look at the Algonquin nations. Yeah which mm -hmm. have direct Celtic roots. And right. by the way, the Appalachia, the people who live in Appalachia, heavily Celtic from the Scottish side of it, but brought that Gaelic culture here. And I mean, that still lives today. I've gone out and seen 
native musicians from the Appalachians because I love right. that kind of roots music and discover the Scotch and Welch yes. origins as well. You see, right. we're now not talking about Ireland and Celtic culture. We're talking about the Gaelic culture and the yeah. wider culture of a network that when you begin to look at it enough, yeah. you'll see the indigenous people in a different way. Well, and don't, migration, right? Yeah. And don't you think that like that this idea of like a world civilization, like when you hear people talk about Atlantis, they're not talking about all these broken up different cultures. It was a one my, grand civilization. Don't you think they're trying to bastardize that idea with the way that they're making this house, this ridiculous uh, version of multiculturalism that they're trying to force upon everyone right now? It's a complete bastardization of what you're talking about. That's well, just bleeding enough. off the bloodlines and the, in the, in the indigenous. Yeah. 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 Right, Kara. yeah. Well, a couple of things. Interestingly enough, she just, she just helped me have a bit of a potential epiphany there. And you know, I'm always talking about. Um, authentic, enlivened creation, and inauthentic, mm -hmm. unenlivened creation, and that is the predator, the AI copies. Mm -hmm. Well, we had a global situation, we had a global culture, did we not? We did. It was enlivened, it was real, it was authentic, it was original. Well, what's the one world order then, if not an inauthentic copy yeah. of global culture? Do you, this is what I was thinking when she yeah. was saying that. Yeah. And this is an inauthentic, you know, false, false copy. Yeah, and it's just like, it's exactly, it's in the same, my point with the multicultural thing is, it, you have certain areas of the world throughout history, where different cultures came together in an organic way, and very interesting came, things came of them mixing. But this thing they're doing now where they're trying this enforced multiculturalism is the synthetic AI version that creates nothing but problems. Right, right, right. That, let me tell you something. One of the um, most, to me, uh, ample pieces of evidence that the tide is turning, and that the Fay are, are basically coming into their own again, is this thing that would happen with the pipeline and the Native mm -hmm. American uh, groups that are coming from all over the world to beat the drums, sing the songs, and do the dances, you know? Raise, yeah, their, raise their voices again. You know, it was the coming together there that was more important than anything else of all the tribes. Of course, yeah. It, it, it's interesting that you say that because it's been a while since I've been in touch with the woman who was channeling the Ferens, but during the period of time I was, they were completely obsessed with stopping the Keystone Pipeline. So yeah. the fact that you say this Fey thing is a Dakota, they, they really don't, they, they really hate that because they understand that they, and also a lot of times those pipelines seem to run very close to where ley lines are and it's bleeding energy that should be yeah. energy yeah. for the world that's bleeding it. Right, right. Yeah. 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 So that was a huge, that was a huge indication that, um, that, that there's power, that there's power, you know, sort of being generated, vortexing around the Native American populations again. So this is all very hopeful and, and honestly, who can stop them anyway? Who the hell can even stop, could stop the Fae once they, once they really get going and get under our skin? Again, I don't, I just don't see, I see this as the turning of the tide. We just have to know, it's, it, it's, it's like, it's like what Randy was talking about in 2016. It's been really difficult to stay on that horse, to ride mm. that horse through the storm, yeah. through the hurricane, <laughs> right? All you're the bucking bronco. Riders <laughs> on the storm, on baby. Staying on that horse, but um, this is part of the evidence that we're staying on the horse, I think, is that um, even though it got used by CNN and Obama and all that to their own ends, I don't think that that was the original initial um, energy behind it at all. When I saw the Hopi come into that encampment, I just got chills. I thought, Jesus. And you know, we were all sitting there watching. We had, I'm sure we all had friends who were there. And um, as each yeah. tribe came in, you know, whether it was from Norway, whether it was from South America, whether it was, you know, the Hopi, the, the Cherokee, the whoever, you know, the Navajo, the Utes, they all showed up. They all showed up. I mean, that was just amazing. This kind of yeah. goes into something I was just going to ask you, and it got folded into that, that narration. When we look at the Fae, we don't know a lot about, we don't know a lot about what you would call their civilization or their governance, but can we kind of 
click through this and, and say that it looks tribal? Is that is is that a reasonable assumption? Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Um, I think the way to think about the Fey is to realize that we have been trained to see these sorts of either um, technological, uh, the way that te technology happens in a culture or the way governance happens in a culture as primitive. And I think we have to flip that understanding, yeah? yeah. Yes. That tribal is actually elevated, that these things yes. are actually more rather yeah. than less. Yeah. We've been trained to see tribal as primitive. We've been trained to see um, working with what's in the earth, which is actually tremendously powerful as archaic and Neolithic and all of that. Mm. And we've been trained to come in um, under government systems that are tyrannical and oppressive and really just slavery. And we have happily and willingly built these towers of what we would call, um, uh, what we would call really um, um, state-of-the-art stuff, you know, big buildings, really we're building our own cells. We're building our own jail cells and we're being taught to call them advanced state-of-the-art stuff. It's how we're talked. It's how we're talked into jailing ourselves. Okay, so yeah, you could call them tribal. What in my mind? One of the things that's going to be the the, the most interesting, Randy, is understanding what they actually were. Because I think, I think that these sets of interpersonal relationships have become so foreign and unknown to us that we a don't trust them, b don't know them when we see them. And, and see really how much governance does an individual actually need. I tend to be an anarchist as well. Me too, yeah. I, I think anarchy is, is probably, I mean, they were druidic and they would have been governed by the magic of creation. Whatever the rules, if there were, yes, well, there had to be, maybe we don't want to call them rules, but it sets of criteria yeah. for creation and generation. That probably would have been their governance. I, my sense is is that there that it would be a more anarchical society, voluntarist society, free will, you know, free free association kind of thing. That if there are any kinds of quote unquote leaders, they would be people who with spiritual wisdom, people who are healers, people who are teachers, and people who have what I like to call earned authority as opposed to declared authority. So, right. like, right, you know, you you've done a lot of research on certain topics. You've earned people's, you've earned your authority from certain people on topics of chemtrails and and the imagination and on the Fey and whatnot, right? You you can't just come out and say, I declare myself, I know everything about Fey, right? right and and right. that's what's happened in this world is that people just they get appointed to positions, they get elected, they win a popularity contest, they haven't shown any true wisdom or inner understanding of oh, it's what they're doing. authoritarian is what it is. It's, yeah, a, it's, yeah. an, author, it's an authoritarian. 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 Yeah. And, okay, so there is, what, what your, this conversation brought to mind to me in terms of the book with these characters of the Druids. There was a high Druid. There was always a high mm -hmm. Druid with these folks, also known as the Allfather, which is the other yes. name for Odin. Yes, yes. this is yeah. really, really important. Remember that that the Norse myths and the Tuatha and this I hate to even say myths, stories, they're the stories overlap in really significant ways. There is a character. Um, there were two battles of Moitor. The first one was the original battle, the one that's still going on. There was another one that um, had to do with um, with one of the original Fomorans who had an eye that was a weapon all kinds of speculation what that was, okay? Um, he was called uh, Valor of the Baleful Eye. Yeah, Valor of the Baleful wow. Eye. And he went up against um, one of the first humans, which in my opinion, which was Lou. Um, however, at that time, the High Druid went to visit an entity, a very mysterious female entity called the Morgu. The Morgu, and you spelled it. M O R G U E. Yeah. Well, in my language, that says Morg. <laughs> okay. I mean, I just looked at that word one time and went, what? Anyway, Morgu, who had some other names as well, but Morgu was this female, and he went to find out how to get the drop on this army. Where are they going to land? 
you know, he, when he found her, she was walking around in a river of blood. This is who she, she's like the um, a knower of death, a knower of battle, the understander of, of this kind of, you know, blood sacrifice kind of thing. Um, and so he did get the information that he needed. And um, she, all she asked in return was the blood of every slain, uh, everyone slain at this battle. That's what she wanted in return was blood. So for me, that was very much the, the first blood sacrifice. The first, you know, I mean, it was described right then and there. The question remains though, who was this entity? Who was this entity then? Who required the first blood sacrifice in order, you know, in order for victory, inside information for victory. Um, and I can't remember why I brought that up. Now, what were we talking about? Anyway. Uh, <coughs> well, we were talking about authoritarian. Authority, yeah. uh, and, which brings it right back into it. This, this crosses over into some of the things that I'm doing with Shamil Asher. It crosses yeah. over into a lot of the stuff that I've done over the last 10 years, which goes into ritual sacrifice, how we wound up with a culture that sustains itself sacrificing animals. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's this other dynamic, and I was well, thinking I think about one of the this. Things that's important. Good. Okay, really quickly, because <clears throat> the second half of that was that there was a woman who appeared who was the daughter of one of the chiefs in these battles who tried to stop the druid from participating. And there was like this huge magical battle. I'm going to throw this magic at you, and I'm going to throw this magic back at you. And she couldn't stop him. He ended up participating in the battle. So isn't it interesting? To me, it's hugely interesting that some female, magical female, tried to stop him from participating in the first blood sacrifice, but he did. And look where we are now. What brought that to mind was the Druids, as because they were sort of magical rulers at that time. Anyway, go ahead, Randy. Remember to say that. No, actually, well, no, I'm glad you brought that up because we're, we're dangling a lot of strings here, which, by the way, is why we're having this interview because you need to get the book. You gotta get and, the book. Uh, you gotta gotta read the book. So I also here, thought of what. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, here's here was the thought that I was having because this came up earlier. People have asked about, for instance, if there are benevolent ETs, why haven't we heard from them? Why haven't they helped us? The same with the, uh, with you know the the. the too often on. Well, the answer is that they have been, and you may have been contacted. Look, I, I maybe shared this with you, that between three and five years old, I had contacts with beings that I believe may have been the Fae. They fit the yeah. profile. And what yeah, they yeah. leave you with is they leave you with sovereignty because they tell you, we're going to teach you how to learn. We're not going to teach you everything. We're going to give you a certain level of knowledge, but you have to go with this. The right. desire for us to have a savior program has been our downfall. That is authoritarian. That's the authoritarian yeah. mindset. Yeah. They nurture that in us because it's a form of dependence. What we need to understand Draco, is, it's very Draco. What we need to understand is there is help. That help comes to us as we bid it. And the way we bid it is, again, we extend our energies out. We have to go back inside of ourselves, discover who we are authentically, because mm -hmm. apparently they connect with children. Yeah. They, they connect with children because energetically, the child is the purest form in which to impart certain things. So... This is the idea of the fairy stealing babies. It's not it, really stealing yeah, babies. It's not stealing. Connecting right. Children. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's, a lot of your abduction yeah. stories bear a lot of similarity to the, the baby abduction stories. And we yeah. don't really understand that. But I'm starting to feel, yeah, I'm starting to see a lot more people compare the alien abduction experience to fairy, like the lore, folklore of the fairy kind of experiences. It's probably more accurate, yeah. 
Right. We have to make sure we represent that properly, though, because otherwise it's just another mechanism sure. to yeah. scare yeah. people, right? Yeah. So, anyway. Okay, so what else, guys? I just had one thought, really interesting, and it's funny because you just said it randomly. You said that he had an evil eye that was a weapon. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that it made me think of... Eye. If you look at the graphics of CERN, it looks like the iris of the eye. And CERN is, a, they tell us it's a Hadron Collider, but it's really more of a time-space reality creation weapon, right? And so I just wonder if his, if his eye that was a weapon was creating some sort of distorted reality that was... There's just so much exciting to investigate here and think about, yeah. isn't there? It's yeah. just bottomless. It's just bottomless, right? I remember what, the one thing I forgot to say, We were because Randy was talking about, because we've I know, I'm sure Emily's had these experiences. Many, 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 many people have had them. Um, and probably most people have had them and forgotten them, you know? <laughs> but one of, the, one of the guys that brought me the um, information about the Battle of Moitura, um, we had coffee, and he was just talking and giving me some information, and and this, that, and the other thing. And, um, and finally, we were getting ready to part company. And <clears throat> he said to me, I want to show you a picture. So he had this book and he opened up. It was the, this drawing that he had of some of the major um, spiritual entities in Ireland. And he said, I want to tell you a story. I said, all right. And he said, um, when I was a little boy, my parents took me to this area near the Boyne River. And I was just really, really little, and I kind of wandered off by myself. And all of a sudden, there was this woman, and that, that's very Faye as well. This woman appeared before me, whether it's Mary or, you know, all these apparitions of females. This is very Faye. They do show themselves in that way, by the way, okay, when they want to. And I said, really? What was it? And she, he said, we had, I just was mesmerized by her, and we had the, the best talk, and we were just kind of being there by the river. And then all of a sudden, she leaned down and she whispered in my ear, we're not supposed to be here. And then she disappeared and I didn't see her again. And he looked at me and he picked up this book and he showed me this picture and he goes, it's you. He said, I know it's you. It's, it was you the minute I saw you. I knew it was you. And I went, oh, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, whoa. And he showed me this drawing. He said, see, it was you. And this happens all the time. To yeah. all of us, to all of us, it's not, yeah. They, yeah. they are telling us that they are there. These female apparitions, one of the- It's interesting too that it happens by water, because once again, we're always. dealing with the water thing. Always. Yeah. yeah. It's always water. Yeah. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I have never been, I am always almost unable to walk away from a waterfall. It just mm. absolutely sends me into a different uh, state yeah. of being. I'm, like I'm like I'm just mesmerized. A waterfall would just mesmerize me. But <clears throat> yes, oh, water water is a great transporter. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so this kind of yeah. And by the way, this was one of the main main reasons for the Inquisition. It's why all the women died. You know, they were searching for people. They were searching for people like any of the people that you've heard that appeared. They were searching for apparitions. They were killing anybody who had any connection to the power, the prior power, right? That's one of the main reasons for the Inquisition. So, killing the magic. Killing the magic. And that's what we've really done, you know? We are trying to. Yeah. We're here to resurrect it. <laughs> we have to. Right now. We not only, I say we have to, we don't have to. We have choices and we have choices to live in this uh, flat plane 3D reality, but it's not serving us very well. And, uh, right. you know, again, you know, a lot of what we've talked about in the show tonight has to do with transforming ourselves because that's what we have to do. Right. And we do it right. through magic. It's not. It's not Aleister Crowley magic. It's not sideshow carnival magic. It's the real magic that actually, this is the magic of nature itself. The, to be able to reconnect with the vital energies because we're disconnected from them. Look what we've done with our so-called civilizations. We've destroyed the energetic flow of our world. You know, 
how feng shui are cities? Not really. And they're cubes. Yeah. They're, they're, everything about them impedes energy flow. Right. Well, there's a, they're, 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 they're distorted sacred geometry cities. And this is where you got to get Maria. You got to get Maria on to talk. Yeah. This is really her wheelhouse. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. And she's fantastic. You love no, her. I would love to talk to her about that for sure. <laughs> I will tell her that. It's just got to come out of the field. Come yes. away. Come away. Come away. <laughs> Maria. So where, where you could get on a computer. Or else we need to go to Ireland next April. Okay. And, come and yes. We're going to be there for a couple weeks at least. Okay. Totally. I want you guys to come and I want, I dearly, I've already invited Randy. I was trying to get you guys up to San Francisco. I would dearly love for you guys to participate in these workshops and really cast your eye over what's going on and add your thoughts and add, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because it's, it's going to be organic. It really, there'll be a lot there to begin with, but it will, it, if everybody puts their imagination and their power in it, it will really become something that will really be enlivened. So I, I really want you guys to well, that would be awesome. That's something to consider. So yes. yeah, sure. I think yes. we need to. I need to think we need to sew that out there. Yeah. Because um, sew it out there. That's right. And I'm trying to do them all over the country. So maybe I'll end up. I mean, Randy's in a part of the world that's that I that I know. Um, mm. because, because the Waldorf School down there at Kimberton. I would yep. love to come down there and do some stuff. Um, because and that does cross my mind every once in a while. Why can't I get something down? where Randy is so we can hang out, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm sure it would be welcome down there by the community. But anyway, anyway, so we're gonna, we're gonna find you. We're gonna bring it to you. We're gonna tell us about it and you're gonna tell us what you think, okay? <laughs> Come to Ireland, you know? We're doing yeah. Ireland for that three weeks in April, two or three weeks in April, so. There you go. Cool. <laughs> we'll send that out there. Kara, as we kind of wrap up, Okay. Um, what has been an enormously fun and enlightening conversation. Is there anything you feel like we kind of didn't touch on tonight? Anything that you want to put out there as we, because we, here we are at the end of 2016. Uh, I feel exactly. like we're in a complete shift. You see, that's, you were reading my mind again, Randy. That's really, that's really what I think that, um, if there we can find the if we can find the words to help us uh, navigate the end of this year into the beginning of next year, um, we need to use them. Yeah. This has been I don't want to say difficult because that's I suppose I could say difficult. I suppose I could say challenging, but it has been a tumultuous. Yeah. Still a year filled with so much turmoil, so many things falling away that need to fall away, right? Yeah. Um, so much illumination and it's sometimes unspeakable illumination and, and we just kind of had to hold our breath and remember that we are really sometimes only called to witness what's in front of us so that we can carry the image, the cleaned image forward. Um, and to remember that just because we don't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist in the darkness. So we might as well bear witness to the fact that it's coming into the light and, and be happy and be glad about that. Um, we, it's been a very difficult, I use horse metaphors all the time. It's been a very difficult horse to stay on this year. It really has. And as we got toward the end of the year, it compacted itself. The energy, <laughs> yeah, right? The energy that yeah. still needed to burn the energy that still needed to burn is still burning and it's burning. I mean, it's almost like it's burning so hot and so weirdly that it's like this book and all you can do is shove a, shove a bookmark in there so you can look at it later. Okay. Bookmark that bookmark that bookmark that because I need to look at that later and you don't, you can't catch your breath long enough to look at it now. That's what's yeah. happening. And that's okay. That's okay. We're fully capable of carrying all of that. Remember that 2017 is pregnant with possibility and power. I just know it is. I just yeah. know it is. So, so stay hopeful and stay um, optimistic. Stay very, very optimistic about every day that's yeah. coming away. 
but remember, it's not January 1st yet. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, not January 1st yet. And anything that has to still be burned off still has to be. Just keep talking about it. Just keep talking to each other. Okay. That's really what I want to say. I can say that you're magic till the cows come home, and I bloody well mean it. You know? But until we get people to uh, uh, grasp that sword, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more with what you just said. And um, yeah, this was really cool. I'm glad we finally got to talk here. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, Emily, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> Randy talks about you all the time. <laughs> there you are. So yeah, it's great to, great to finally talk to you. And I agree with all those things you just said. I think um, I've had conversations with lots of people the last week, people, other people who do research and programs and people who are listeners and whatever. I think everybody's feeling that we can really do something in 2017. So let's just stay with that. Let's, it might be rough. Let's just, let's ride that all the way through, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. There's a new power at work. And, and by the way, I hate to bring up the name Trump. <laughs> but I will say, I will say right now is what we ha what we have right now is our our um, spaces of possibility and power between one thing and another. Right. That's now. That's exactly what I've been very saying. Very since. clear. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Very clear. It's, it's, it's it not, is a corridor into and a yeah, third place yeah. that's neither of the two worlds that they wanted to build for us. Right. People it said is. we made horrible decisions. We did. But the fact that those decisions got made are not implicitly the choices we're now going to walk into. We walk into a third way, a fourth way, a fifth way. That's right. I feel that this is, yeah. the, is one of the biggest breathing opportunities humanity's had in a very long time. It is not the old regime. It is not the old evil. It may be a new evil. I don't know. Yeah. But it's you know, I don't know yet. I don't know what the hell it is yet. All I know is yeah. we're, we're existing in a space where we have a we have a lot of we have a lot of opportunity and power to do some yeah. stuff right now. So yeah, so let's live in that right now too. And that well, but we've gone through what's called what's called a disruptive cycle. Yeah. Everything's off balance. That means there's the opportunity to walk in to the middle spaces between all of this and create something new that neither yeah. system could imagine. Isn't that very Taoist as well? Imagine. Yeah. 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 So see, so see, it's uncomfortable because it's, it, we, it, if it's not brand new, we haven't experienced it in millennia probably. Yeah. That's what's, it's feel, that, that's what makes it feel so freaking uncomfortable right now. But it also makes you breathe faster and it makes your heart beat faster. It's um, exciting. It's exciting. Yeah, yeah, it's really exciting. It's like there's a yeah. lot of joy that goes along with it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, listen, nothing will make you feel more alive than a good white knuckle ride. And I think that's what we're in. For. <laughs> and, ah! yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. Randy and Emily, I'm really glad you're in the front of the roller coaster with me. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Arms. It's always good to ride. It's always good to ride this with friends, right? Yeah, for sure. It is, yeah. It's been an awesome conversation, Kara. One more time, give people your contact information as yeah, we go. Yeah. If you just go, if you want the books, and I hope you do, go to Amazon, type my name in, they all come up. Uh, Kara St. Louis, author's page on Facebook. I'm extremely responsive. It's not always what you want to hear, but I am extremely <laughs> <laughs> oh, Right now, especially... Yeah. Um, but I'm very responsive and um, please go to Hard True, go to my channel, subscribe. Let's get that thing going. My aim is to try to get, it's pretty new. It's pretty new, but my aim is to try to get it up to like a thousand subscribers before the end of the year. So that would be, that would be fantastic. Make it happen, guys. <laughs> Make it happen. Make it okay. Show. That's going to wrap it up for this time. This is Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV as we close out. 2016 you might get another podcast or so before we do that but uh on behalf of myself and emily we bid you all a blessed new year and uh, we'll turn the corner on the other side the magic is out there it's inside you now go do something fucking amazing that's right yeah. 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 Night, guys. bye randy bye emily